Brilliant. So, uh, yeah, my name's John, and um, I'm normally a, a principal software architect at, um, at Pure Gym. But today I'm going to share with you something that I kind of was doing as part of a side project. And uh, yeah, I just found it particularly interesting and thought it might be useful for, for others to see it. So what we're going to do is we're going to cover um, just basically what a WARF is. Just a quick recap for those of you who have not used it before um, or, or need a refresh. Uh, we're then going to talk about a WARF flows and the basis behind looking at device code is that it's a new, newer OAuth flow, and the others didn't really suit what I needed. So I thought it's worth quickly going through the other flows. Um, and then we'll spend most of the time actually looking what device flow is and how it solves a different problem. Um, all of this I'm going to show you now um, is also available as a code sample, and you can see that in the, the footer of the, the presentation. So if we just start with uh, what is OAuth? Well, it's an open standard for authorization. And what that really means is that instead of using uh, basic auth, so when you make API requests, passing a username and password across as a, a header, instead of that, what we can do is we can go and get a token and use that token to make all of our API requests. And the advantage of using a token-based system is that we never need to worry about managing or handling, shall I say, um, the username or password from our end users. So if we're building an app uh, that displays how many likes you have on Facebook, we don't want people putting in their Facebook username and password into our app. What we do is we use OAuth, an OAuth flow in order to redirect them off to the Facebook website. They enter their username and password, give permission for us to access it, and then we get back a token, which we can then use for all of the requests we need. So it's all about separating out the username and password, passing that over to the people who should really look after it rather than our application, and then having permission to do what we need. The OAuth standard has been around since 2012. Um, so as developers, a lot of us have, have touched on it. But it is a complex subject when you start looking at how you get that token. And, and that brings us on to the, um, to the OAuth flow. So, the other flows talk about how we go and get that token. And the most simple one is a client credentials flow. So this is machine to machine. So if you've got a service and it only ever needs to connect to one third party and you've got one account on it and you've both shared a client ID in secret, um, they can work together with the machine flows. But it wasn't really suitable for what I was looking to do. I was building a Windows service that I wanted lots of different people to use and to attach to their Microsoft account, and I don't know what their, their account was. So not suitable for what I needed. Uh, we could look at password grant flow. This allows you to get a token by passing across a username and password, but it kind of defeats the point of what we're trying to do, um, and that's why they've marked this as, as legacy. Uh, as an application, we don't want to be handling usernames and passwords for other systems. Um, so we want to avoid using password grant. The next one is the one that, as an end user, you're probably the most familiar with. It's, it's called authorization code flow, but essentially your application in the web browser uh, triggers, uh, triggers a flow which will redirect the user off to another website. The Facebook example is, is the classic one here. So web app redirects you, it says, okay, this other app requires the permissions. Are you happy with them? At this point, the person is on Facebook. They may have entered their username and password on the Facebook site. And once they've done all of that, the application then gets the token. So it's the one that most, uh, most people probably would recognize. But the problem with it is that you require a browser. And if you're writing a Windows service or uh, an application where you don't necessarily have access to the browser, uh, that's, a, that's a challenge. And that's where device code comes in. So what is device code in a bit more detail? Well, it's an OAuth flow exactly designed to solve this problem. It's just for browserless and what they would term as input constrained devices. So what we're gonna have a look at now 
is just a couple of scenarios where this is particularly useful. Now, I don't know how many of you have ever tried to, uh, to log in on, um, on a web browser on a, on a TV, but the on-screen keyboard is a horrible experience and trying to interact with a website on a, on a TV just doesn't work very well. You, you can get over this by creating a more native experience, such as uh, what happens with, with Netflix, which is fine if it's your own service that you're logging into. But when it comes to things like uh, your application running on the TV, wanting to access Facebook, Spotify, or whatever, you're not going to be wanting people to put in their, their, their Facebook login password into your UI, because they're not going to trust it. So device code flow gets around this. And what happens is on the individual device, you make a request. It then prompts the user on a different device to go to a website in which they can enter the code. And then eventually, when that's all happened, your app will get its token back. Um, there's lots of examples of this, and you may have, may have seen that. But very few of us actually get to write apps that run on TVs. I mean, I've never written one and don't really have any plans to. But device code flow can be used in so many other scenarios. One of those is for IoT devices. So there might be a scenario where you only have two lines of text. And typically, a well, browser is not going to fit on that. However, what will fit is a URL and a passcode. But even taking that a step further, we might not even have a screen at all. Well, you can then still display it either in an SSH terminal or in something like this. This is the Azure, this is the Azure command line. Uh, sorry, Cloud Shell, should I say. Um, it's doing exactly the same there. It's, it's just a command line interface. It's showing you uh, a URL to go to and the individual code, a code which expires in, in 15 minutes. So that's the kind of premise of, of what device code flow is. But let's have a look at a deeper dive in how we'd implement this into our, into our code. So you've written your application and it's sitting on the say, TV in this scenario. It makes the request off for the third party uh, API. That will send back the URL and the code. Now your app will continually poll that API saying, can I have the auth token? Can I have an auth token? And it keeps coming back and saying, no, it's still pending. Meanwhile, your end user sat on the sofa with their mobile phone will then visit the, uh, visit the, the site. They'll then be prompted, enter the token, enter the, uh, to enter the code that they're given, should I say. Uh, at this point, your app that is continually polling for an OAuth token will eventually get one back and you can see the, the user is happy. So what I'm going to do is just quickly show you what that looks like in a set of rest calls. So if we bring Postman up, so this Postman collection, as I said, is on GitHub if you want to have a, have a look. The first thing we do is make our initial request. And uh, the, what I'm logging into here is the um, Microsoft Graph API. So once you've set it up all in Azure and the instructions are on the GitHub for that as, as well, you can make this, uh, make this request to their, to their login endpoint, just passing in a tenant ID um, and a set of uh, other values. We send that off. And as you can see, we get back here our user code, which we can copy, um, and the URL. You also get it as a nice friendly message, which you can just echo out to the user. It also shows you a, a retry interval, and that's for the, the next step, the polling. So if we now look at the second request, and this is where we try and get the token. So we send it, um, and what comes back is authorization pending. Um, and we can use that retry, uh, so the, um, the interval, to poll every five seconds for the new, to see, to see if we've got token yet. So if we go back to the initial request and act as the user, so we'll go to microsoft.com slash device login, bring up the web browser, um, and that's what it looks like. It actually redirects you to, to this URL. And it's simple as just asking you for the code. The user then types the code in, we collect 
click next. We're now prompted uh, which account to use. I've got multiple accounts. And we get a nice uh, screen saying that it's all, uh, all dealt with. Um, this is all configurable uh, when you set up your application in Azure. So now if we go back to Postman, uh, we'll be able to pull the token again. Instead of authorization pending, we now get a full bearer token, uh, access token, and refresh token. Um, we can just use that in a standard request. In this, I'm just using the slash me endpoint just to grab my personal data, and we can see, see all the information there. Uh, it also fully supports refresh tokens, so you only need to do this the very first time. And when the token expires, you can use the uh, refresh token that you got uh, when you polled for the token, um, represent that, and refresh. Um, refresh that like you can with uh, most um, our other OAuth flows. So. So that was it, really. Nice, quick, short uh, demo. And um, as I said, the, the samples are on there. I'll share the link afterwards. Um, so yeah, any questions? We'll need the questions again. 